Good morning. Nancy is going to begin our prelude here this morning, and uh, I'll turn it over to you here, Nance.
Well, good morning, Emmanuel. Good morning to our Waterloo Wayside communities. And of course, good morning to everyone who is joining in on uh, Facebook Live this morning. Well, greetings to all of you in the name of our creator, the one who brings us all together for the sake of love. Well, Rachel and I are spending a few days in the uh, beautiful city of Collingwood and uh, I'm coming to you live this morning on the edge of the shores of the great Georgian Bay. I wish I could turn the camera around so that you could have the lake view this morning, but when I do that, it's too bright uh, and so it doesn't work. So I hope that you can see some of the reflection of the water behind me uh, in the glass. And uh, I'm so grateful uh, that uh, Rachel and I get to spend a few days up here uh, with our uh, my, my mother-in-law and stepfather-in-law, Deb Richmond and Enzo Baldessini. Thank you so much for allowing us to spend a few days with you up here in beautiful nature. So uh, Nancy, though, however, and Rob Seamus, are coming to you live this morning from the Emmanuel United Church Sanctuary. And I look forward to joining them next Sunday where we will be all together for the first time coming to you live from the Emmanuel United Church Sanctuary. But for today, uh, we are still uh, remote, but uh, happy to be together with you from our various places. Today we are talking about rocks and stumbling blocks and stepping stones. So Peter, who Jesus last week named the rock, this week quickly becomes the stumbling block when a moment of crisis has him trying to hold on too tightly. And he will learn, and perhaps maybe we all will learn that Love is actually liberating. And so what was once his stumbling block with a little help from Jesus, well, will ultimately become his stepping stone. But before that, let us all begin by grounding ourselves on the indigenous land on which we uh, find ourselves this morning. Here in Collingwood, the town of Collingwood uh, recognizes all the indigenous peoples of Turtle Island. And so I'm reflecting on all the indigenous peoples from Turtle Island this morning. And uh, our folks, for, for any, any of you, wherever you are, I invite you to uh, reflect on the indigenous land in which you find yourselves. But for the folks back in Waterloo region, while well, we acknowledge the traditional territory upon which you are gathered. In 1784, the Haldeman Treaty granted a tract of land to the Haudenosaunee, Six Nations Iroquois peoples as compensation for their alliance with British forces during the American Revolution. This tract of land includes 10 kilometers on either side of the Grand River, which is known as the Haldeman Tract. And the original peoples of this land include the Attawandaran, also known as the neutral peoples, as well as the Anishinaabe. 
Today, less than 5% of this territory remains Six Nations land. The original peoples of this land sought to walk gently, and we endeavor to follow their example. We seek a new relationship with First Nations peoples through truth and reconciliation, and we actively seek right relations based in honor and in deep respect. Friends, let us open in prayer. Creator God, you have created all things good. Nothing is beyond your reach or your redemption. You call on us to reveal your presence and to speak of your faithfulness from generation to generation. Wherever we gather, you are there. You were here before we arrived, and you will remain long after we leave. Your presence makes every space a sacred space. You delight in our praise and rejoice in all of your people, and we find a way to acknowledge your presence in our world and in our lives. May our time of worship bring us back to you. May it bring us back to each other. And may it increase our awareness of you at the center of our life, calming our fears and restoring our souls, and leading us all to the frame where we are freed, knowing ourselves as beloved, knowing ourselves united with you and with all of your creatures. Amen. Jesus said, peace I leave with you, a peace the world cannot give. May the peace of Christ be with you. And we know that we hold each other close in this time of being apart. And we know that even though we may be physically distanced from one another in the age of COVID, we are never socially distant. Amen. And uh, so at this time, I'd like to invite any of the uh, children or the kids that we have online with us this morning. And I know you won't be able to see our children's time here for those of you joining on Facebook. Um, but uh, you're welcome to watch in from this perspective. We have uh, baby Alex with us this morning. I see baby Alex. Good morning, Megan and Alex. Good morning. And there's... Uh, Clara Good, morning. Good morning. Hi, Alex. Good morning, Clara. Oh, I saw uh, Delaney uh, on there as well, but then uh, she disappeared. How is everybody doing this morning? Hello, Delaney. Good morning. Doing well, well here? Bridget oh, is good. wearing her shiniest dress. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh, Delaney and Murray keep popping in and out there. But um, so I wanted to talk to you all a little bit about what we were going to be talking about in church today. And there's a piece of um, there's a Bible story that we're going to be talking about today where Jesus and Peter actually get into an argument. They get into a bit of a disagreement. And uh, I was wondering if um, any of you know what it's like to have a disagreement with somebody. Have any of you ever been in a disagreement with anybody? <laughs> yeah, Delaney's nodding, yes, yes. Clara, how about you? Do you know what it's like to be in a disagreement? Have you ever disagreed with anybody? Yeah, yes. getting a lot of heads on. <laughs> I'm on social media on the internet. I think that means that it was going to happen eventually. Right, right. So for, for those of you joining on Facebook, uh, uh, Clara said, yeah, she uh, she's on the social media. And so she definitely knows what it's like to get into a disagreement. Delaney and Murray were shaking their head yes as well. Well, so what do we do when we're in a disagreement with one another? You know, uh, does that mean that um, we don't like each other? 
does that have to mean that we're we're uh, we're angry with each other? So what we're learning today in our Bible story is that Peter and and Jesus actually have this disagreement. But because of the disagreement that they have, they actually learn more about Peter actually learns more about who he's supposed to be. And he actually gives the opportunity then for Jesus to teach him a little bit more about uh, love. And so uh, I was wondering, I know, like, I, I remember a time when I had a disagreement with my mom. Um, I was just really little. And uh, I think I forget, really, I think I was supposed to clean up my room. And uh, I told her that I did, but I really didn't. So I, I kind of, it was like a fib. And so when she, I, of course, she caught me because uh, it was like an hour later or something. And uh, she was like, you didn't clean up your room. You know, you're, you were fibbing. And so she had to teach me that wasn't really a nice thing to, to have a fib. So we had a little bit of a spat. Um, but I learned uh, a couple of things from that. I learned, number one, that I shouldn't fib to my mom because she always catches me. Uh, uh, and number two, I learned that if I would have just, uh, you know, told the truth, then um, it, I would have been, it would have been a better, it would have been better all around. But uh, has any of you ever experienced anything like that? Yeah. And did you learn from it? Did you learn from it? So because I learned something from it, I feel like it wasn't necessarily, you know, uh, it wasn't all bad, right? So as long as we learn from our mistakes, then they can become more like stepping stones rather than stumbling blocks. Does that make sense? Do we, do we learn? We learn when we get into disagreements with other people. We can, we can still love people even though we're in disagreements with them. And we can also still use the opportunity to learn. Uh, wow, there's Chris this morning. Good morning, Chris. We can learn from, from our mistakes and we can learn uh, from them. And as long as we learn from the things, uh, our experiences, then, um, then that's always a good thing. All right. Well, does anybody else have anything they want to share before we I uh, let you go? Okay, well, we'll see you at the end of the service. It's been great to spend a few minutes with you. I always love to see you. And we'll see you again at the end of the service where we can share a time of fellowship together. Bye for now. And uh, I'm so happy to tell you that uh, Rob is going to be helping us sing this morning. And Rob is actually in the sanctuary of Emmanuel. He's in the Emmanuel United Church Sanctuary. There he is. Good morning, Rob. I'm not sure if Rob can hear me, but I can see you. And uh, I'm going to turn things over to you now, Rob and Nancy. Okay. Come and find the quiet center in the crowded life we lead. Find the room for hope to enter. Find the frame where we are free. Clear the chaos and the clutter. Clear our eyes that we can see all the things that really matter. Be at peace and simply be. Silence is a friend who claims us, cools the heat and slows the pace. 
God it is who speaks and names us, knows our being face to face, making space within our thinking, lifting shades to show the sun, raising courage when we're shrinking, finding scope for faith begun. In the spirit, let us travel open to each other's pain. Let our loves and fears unravel, celebrate the space we gain. There's a place for deepest dreaming. There's a time for heart to care. In the spirit's lively scheming, there is always room to spare. Thank you, Rob. You sounded great coming to us from the sanctuary this morning. Friends, our scripture today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, and uh, it's chapter 16, verses 21 to 26. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he had to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and legal experts, and that he had to be killed and then raised on the third day. Then Peter took hold of Jesus, scolding him, began to correct him. God forbid it, Lord. This won't happen to you. But Jesus turned to Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. You are a stone that could make me stumble. For you are not thinking God's thoughts, but human thoughts. Then Jesus said to his disciples, all who want to come after me must say no to themselves, take up their cross and follow me. All who want to save their lives will lose them. But all who lose their lives because of me will find them. Why would people gain the whole world but lose their lives? What will people give in exchange for their lives? Herein lies wisdom. Thanks be to God. Get behind me, Satan. Oh, these halting words become as if an arrow meeting its mark, piercing straight through the center of Peter's heart. In five short verses, Peter goes from the rock to the stumbling block. In today's story, Jesus begins to broach the topic of his own death. And Peter wants none of it. God forbid it, Lord. Jesus and Peter are getting into this little spat. And I kind of get this image in my mind of all the other disciples standing around, you know, jaw dropping, watching this argument. And you can bet if this happened today, this crowd would be pulling out their cell phones and, uh, you know, starting to take some video of this argument. Jesus is like, I got to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things. And Peter is like, hell you are. And Jesus comes out with, get behind me, Satan. Ugh. Now, I don't know. I'm kind of with Peter here. If someone I loved came up to me and said, yeah, I got to go now. Uh, I got to go suffer many things and die. Well, you can be bet you can bet I'd be like, no, I don't think so. You know, let's not and say we did. 
So Peter's deep love for Jesus catapults him into action, renouncing such atrocity like any of us would. Peter's beautiful humanity is palpable in this story. Remember last week, uh, Peter had just named Jesus the Messiah. And what we are witnessing here today is his struggle to understand that naming Jesus Messiah is actually about to change him forever, or perhaps rather initiate his process of his becoming the rock. Jesus, uh, or sorry, naming Jesus Messiah is not a long awaited conclusion, but rather only the beginning of a process to which Peter will need to unlearn all he thought he knew in order to make way for all that he is to become. Peter, like many of us, needs to unlearn the God of his understanding so that he can relearn about a God he had never met. Peter could not, to be, could not begin to imagine that Jesus, the Messiah, had not come to overthrow oppression. He had not come to uh, confront uh, oppression with a military might, but rather he came to confront by way of love. He could not imagine that Jesus would not be standing beside him on the day that the new church dawned. He could not imagine that a crucifixion could ever give way to a resurrection. In this moment of crisis, Peter wants to bind Jesus to himself, to hold tightly, but he doesn't yet understand that holding on to Jesus is holding him back. The cross only makes sense in light of the resurrection, but for now, it only brings heartbreak and despair. Before the cross was something to believe in, it was a journey of unlearning, a breaking down of all they thought they knew in order to relearn how one might come to believe in something different. Peter's great unlearning comes with great pause. Peter would eventually have to press pause on all those old tapes that ran through his mind about expecting a military messiah. And in that pause, consider perhaps that God might be something altogether different than what he'd come to expect. We expect that God's love should look like human love. Why does God's love not include protection from pain and death? If you think of human love, you think of throwing yourself in front of a speeding car, right? To protect your child. Human love involves protecting a loved one from harm at all costs. But yet, we all know, try as we might, loved ones still die. Loved ones die of cancer. Loved ones die in tragic accidents. And sometimes, despite all of our greatest effort, loved ones die. So if we are so beloved, where is God's intervention and protection? How did Peter get it so wrong when all he wanted to do was protect Jesus from harm? I think we live in a pain avoidant world. And in our pain avoidant world, the idea that we should embrace suffering as a response to God's call sounds ridiculous, right? But I also think it's unrealistic to think that we can ever avoid pain. And so I think part of the lesson today is accept the reality that to really love is to inevitably experience pain as part of the process of living. 
when we love, we will at some point suffer. But the suffering of having never loved, I think, is far greater. When Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, he actually uses the same word as he did when he was uh, being uh, tempted by the evil one uh, in the desert. When Peter tries to block Jesus from his path to save pain, he actually is becoming like the tempter. He is tempting Jesus not to fulfill that all of what his life is to be about. And so that's why Jesus goes into the diatribe about pick up your cross and follow me. Uh, follow me means get behind me. Uh, don't stand out in front and block me. Peter wants to bind Jesus to himself to prevent them both from suffering. But what Jesus comes to show us is that love is always about letting go, uh, even when it hurts. Love is always liberating or else it's not love, it's something else. Love is never binding or blocking or controlling or restricting. Maya Angelou knew this when she said, I am grateful to have been loved and to be able to love because that liberates. Love liberates, it doesn't just hold, that's ego. Love liberates, it doesn't bind. Anyone who has children knows that at some point you have to let your children go into a world that will inevitably cause them pain. This does not mean that we believe in a sadistic God. It means that when we project human love onto God, we reduce God to nothing more than human, while at the same time asking God to be a power greater than humanity. It naturally follows then, do we want God to be like us or do we want God to be God? Any spiritual leader will tell you that people learn more and grow more through times of struggle and pain than otherwise. And I think it's true that real change rarely comes in the absence of crisis. Our church is built upon a grief-stricken rock, a stumbling block redeemed through a resurrection of love. Through love, the crisis of faith that Peter endures actually becomes a stepping stone. How have the crises in your life given way to a level of growth that you were not experiencing otherwise? How does the age of pandemic serve as the crisis point in which real change could actually be a possibility if we were willing to see the process through? When crisis happens, it becomes a stumbling block or a stepping stone. And the only thing that hangs in the balance toward one or the other is the redemptive power of love. Jesus' journey to the cross introduces us to the possibility that belief in the crucified one means courage to love others and the world in spite of the indifference of either. In Jesus, God reveals for us a love willing to descend into the depths of hell in order to be a love that redeems. God is not always a God of our wants, but God is always the God of our needs. Peter's great unlearning resulted in him taking his place behind Jesus, walking to the cross rather than insistently walking him from it. Peter learned a lesson about love that day he learned that the place of love was not in the binding and the holding on, but rather it was in the letting go and in the liberating. The rock relearned the meaning of love, and in doing so, the stumbling block became 
our stepping stone. Amen. And I would invite Rob to come uh, come back and uh, sing for us once again. Nancy and Rob from the sanctuary of Emmanuel United Church. I turn it back over to you. Spirit, open my heart to the joy and pain of living. As you love, may I love in receiving and in giving. Spirit, open my heart. God replaced my stony heart with a heart that's kind and tender. All my coldness and fear to your grace I now surrender. Spirit, open my heart to the joy and pain of living as you love may I love in receiving and in giving spirit open my heart write your love upon my heart as my love my goal my story in each thought, word, and deed, may my living bring you glory. Spirit, open my heart to the joy and pain of living. As you love, may I love. In receiving and in giving, Spirit, open my heart. May I weep with those who weep, share the joy of sister, brother, in the welcome of Christ. May we welcome one another spirit open my heart to the joy and pain of living as you love may I love in receiving and in giving spirit open my Thanks, Rob. Friends, let us pray. Redeeming God, even when we get things wrong, you work to write them on our behalf. Loving God, we've come from our week filled with many things. Some are filled with joy and excitement, others with sorrow and despair. Some are filled with energy, others are filled with weariness. Some are filled with love for you and others wonder where you are or they feel far from you. We are the gathered congregation and we lay ourselves before you with all the honesty that we can muster. We give you all that we are. Create in us loving hearts, hearts that liberate others rather than binding them to the indifference of the world. 
reveal your presence to those who need you now and give us all the courage to use our stumbling blocks as stepping stones through a revealing of your love. And friends, may we take a moment now to pray the silent prayers that may be on our hearts in this moment. And let us now join together in reciting the prayer that Jesus so many years ago taught us to pray. And God is as to all of us like our mother and our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Friends, every time we come to the moment of offering, it's a crossroad. There's an inner struggle between scarcity and generosity. There is a pull between fear of the future and belief in God's providence. Let us offer our gifts freely this morning, stepping out in faith down the road of grace. We do this together as your people called and sent to be a blessing to the world. With gratitude for the sacred labors of love in this place, let us bring our offerings to God and to one another. Since its inception, the church was meant to be a place of chosen family, a family of outcasts and outlaws and dreamers and prophets and humble disciples of love. In the company of divine presence, we create belonging and we nurture justice. We thank you, God, for the generosity that enables us to share, for we are rich in many things. And we dedicate our offerings and ourselves to shaping the community in which you intend, in the spirit of Christ. For we bring to you only, God, what is already yours. Let us all take a moment to consider how our blessings might become a blessing to others. There are still many ways to be able to send uh, your blessings, your donations or offerings to the uh, manual, or manual and Waterloo Wayside communities. Uh, for people who have offering envelopes, you can still mail those in. The church is uh, still picking up its mail uh, daily. And you can mail to the physical address of Emmanuel United Church, 22 Bridgeport Road West, Waterloo, Ontario, postal code N2L2Y3. You can still sign up or alter your pre-authorized remittance. You can contact Laura in the main office. I'm sure she'd love to hear from you. The phone number is 519-886-1471. And uh, you can also go online to the Emmanuel United Church website, which is emmanueluc.ca, and click on the Canada Helps link. And you can also send in uh, e-transfer by emailing our wonderful treasurer, Wendy, at donate at emmanueluc.ca. And Emmanuel is spent e, spelled E M M A N U E L. And uh, let us let us pray for the gifts that we have received and the gifts that we will receive. We give thanks. Accept these gifts for the work of your church, that they may transform and become love for all. 
God of provisions whose currency is love. We offer our resources freely knowing that you want justice rolling down like water. And we offer our blessings back to you as we use our gifts in the service of your work. Accept these gifts from our hands, which we cast upon the waters of your love, a generous, ever-flowing stream, feeding the hungry, advocating for the oppressed, and renouncing injustice everywhere we find it. Amen. And uh, I, real, I just realized that for you on Facebook, I have my earbuds plugged into the laptop, which means you couldn't hear any of the music that was playing. You could only hear my singing. So for that, I truly apologize. This time I'm gonna unplug my uh, headphones. So our closing hymn uh, this morning is uh, from More Voices 83. It's called, Let My Spirit Always Sing. And I will turn it back over to the Emmanuel United Church Sanctuary and to Rob and Nancy. So take it away. Let my spirit always sing. Though my heart be wintering, though the season of despair give no sign that you are there, God to whom my days belong, let there always be a song. Though my body be confined, let your word engage my mind. Let the inner I discern how much more there is to learn. See the world becoming whole through the window of the soul. Let your wisdom grace my years, choose my words and chase my fears. Give me wit to welcome change, to accept and not estrange. Let my joy be full and deep in the knowledge that I keep. Let my spirit always sing to your spirit answering through the silence, through the pain. No, my hope is not in vain, like a feather on your breath, trust your love through life and death. Back to you, Jen. Thanks, Rob. May our love be a love that liberates. May we love even knowing that to love may cause us pain. And in our pain, may we see the stepping stones rather than the stumbling blocks. Friends, go in peace and go knowing that you are loved because God blesses you, God keeps you. God's face is forever shining upon you. And it is for this reason that the peace of Christ is with us all. Amen.